All right, so this begins our uh, unit on the Earth and life through time. And it's one of my favorite units because it looks at the Earth and life through time and how they have changed together and um, influenced each other's development. So geology is the study of the Earth, but the study of life on the Earth and how ancient life changed over time is the study of paleontology, which is a branch of biology. So remember, biology is a huge umbrella, and a lot of other uh, fields fall under that, that umbrella of biology, and paleontology is one of those. So if you're interested in digging up fossils and learning about once living organisms and studying evolution, paleontology is, uh, is the field for you. So paleontologists and what they discover depends primarily on fossils. <clears throat> And there are different types of fossils. The main types are molds, which are impressions. So for example, you may find a fossil that is the impression of a leaf. Casts, which are molds that have been filled in. Um, traces, so you may see even a, a, like a trail where a worm crawled through the mud can be fossilized. Nests, burrows, footprints like they found all kinds of dinosaur footprints that's partly how we know that dinosaurs you know some certain dinosaurs were bipedal walking on two legs um, and i just read an article recently where they found a fossilized turtle that looks like it was crushed by a sauropod, sauropod dinosaur one of those huge plant eating dinosaurs uh, because they found it where there were tracks of sauropods true form fossils are the actual animal or, par or part. And the best example of that um, would be like a woolly mammoth that has been frozen in the permafrost up in the tundra. Um, so, you know, woolly mammoths went extinct about 10,000 years ago, but they're fi they find them frozen in the permafrost. And it's almost like putting meat in, the, in your freezer. It preserves it. And even the soft tissues are preserved because normally it's only the hard tissues that are fossilized. Some of what can, oh, oh and another true form example would be this uh, scorpion in amber. Amber uh, will, it, it's tree sap that encases uh, an animal that might be on the bark of the tree. So the animal will be on the bark and a big glob of sap will engulf it and encase it. And that sap then will turn into amber. It fossilizes into amber. Um, and that's the basis for the movie Jurassic Park, actually. They found insects in amber, and they got the, the blood, dinosaur blood, supposedly, from the, um, from the mosquitoes in the amber, and used, that, used the DNA in that blood to resurrect dinosaurs. An interesting idea, but we haven't been able to figure out how to do it yet. Um, so what can we learn from fossils? The morphology, and there's a vocabulary term you really need to know, morph, you know, if you, if you are familiar with that word morph, maybe from a video game or something, morph uh, just refers to the shape or the form of something. So morphology, the shape or form, the time that that organism or species live, the phylogeny, in other words, the evolutionary relationships with other organisms by comparing <coughs> uh, the morphology of one species to the morphology of another species. We've been able to figure out how species are related to each other, even though they're no longer living. Their habitat, depending on the surrounding fossils, you know, the plants that are fossilized around the fossil and um, other things that are available and fossilized, we can determine uh, to some extent the habitat, even pollen, you know, microscopic fossils that are fossilized in the rock we can infer behavior. So for example, if we find an animal uh, near or on a nest that has eggs, fossilized eggs, a fossilized nest with fossilized eggs, we might infer that that's the, the uh, par <clears throat> parent of those eggs and it's actually sitting on those eggs or, or incubating those eggs or protecting those eggs until they hatch, just like birds. And there have been dinosaurs that have been found uh, in that situation fossilized. DNA sequence. Uh, some of the more recent fossils, not, not the 
you know, dinosaurs, we can't really get DNA uh, information from because they died too long ago, you know, at least 65 million years ago. But more recent fossils, we can actually extract DNA. So, for example, like from woolly mammoths, and it's been suggested we could use that DNA to resurrect woolly mammoths if we wanted to. But again, that technology hasn't really been developed fully yet. So will we ever have a complete fossil record? And by the way, all the fossils is, uh, that we found is known as the fossil record. It won't be complete because there are too many organisms that have lived. Um, we don't even know how many species are on the planet right now, let alone all the species that have ever lived. Not all of the species that have ever lived fossilized. Some of them were soft, don't have hard parts, therefore they didn't fossilize. And we can't find or unearth every single fossil that there is on the planet, so the, the fossil record will never be complete. Just a couple of vocabulary terms here, and I, I'm sure you already know what extinct means, but it means the species is no longer living on the earth, right? Extinct. Now, an, a term that is the opposite of extinct you may not be as familiar with. It is extant. Extant refers to a species that is currently living on the earth. So these are the species that we now have living on the planet. The opposite of extinct. So they are not, not yet extinct and hopefully they never will be extinct. Greater than 99% of all species that have ever lived are now extinct. That means that less than 1% of the species that have ever lived are now extant, are now living on the earth. That's why we will never have a full and complete fossil record, again, because there are so many species that have, have lived on this planet over its four to five billion year age. So how do we know the age of a fossil? Well, um, these very special fossils known as index fossils are one way, and that's a, an example of relative dating. So in other words, relative means in comparison to something else. So it's a method of determining the age of a fossil by comparing its uh, placement with that of fossils in the same or other layers of rock. So if we find a fossil near another fossil, if we find a fossil and we don't know its age, but we find it near another fossil that we do know its age, then we can infer that they lived around the same time, close to the same time. And that that's an example of relative dating. And again, um, it's done by either knowing the age of the strata. So, for example, these layers of rock here, we know all over the earth that certain layers were laid down at a certain time. So if we find a fossil in that layer, we can infer that that organism lived during that time that the strata was laid, that stratum was laid down. Again, index fossils are very useful because there are certain species that we know when they lived they lived for a relatively short period of time, so it narrows down the uh, the time um, that an organism that is found with that index fossil lived, um, and they were very widespread. So those are basically the characteristics of a good index fossil. So again, they were very numerous, widespread, existed for a relatively short time. So again, if you find a, a fossil of something and you don't know its age, and you find index fossils all around it in the same stratum all around it, the, and you know the age of the index fossil, then you can infer that the age of the specimen that you found that you don't know the age of is very close to that of the index fossil. <clears throat> so index fossils include things that uh, fossilize very well. Um, that's another characteristic, actually, that should be in this list. So they're numerous, widespread, existed for a relatively short time, and also have hard parts that, that fossilize really well. So, for example, mollusks in general uh, fossilize really well because they have shells. Foraminiferans uh, fossilize really well. You probably have never heard of foraminiferans, but they're microscopic amoebas that form calcium carbonate shells around themselves, and therefore they fossilize well. But they're microscopic. You need a microscope basically to see them in the rocks. But they are very good index fossils. They have been used very uh, extensively as index fossils. And then trilobites, you may also be uh, familiar with because they're so famous. They're so, and they're so numerous. Um, 
but they fossilize really well because they have an exoskeleton. They're arthropods, so they have an exoskeleton, and that means they fossilize really well. So they make really good, and there have been many species over time, um, so they make really good index fossils. So relative dating is uh, not as ex not very exact, right? Hope you probably got that impression from the previous slide. Uh, but we also have absolute dating. And absolute dating is the determination of the actual age of a rock or fossil, the actual age using a technique like radiometric dating, what's known as radiometric dating, which uses a radioactive isotope, um, which is an atom that has a different number of neutrons. And we haven't covered chemistry yet, uh, the chemistry of life. That's one of our units. But you'll learn that an isotope, and this is something you need to know now, an isotope is an atom that has a different number of neutrons, and sometimes that makes that atom unstable so that it's radioactive, and it throws off particles, and it actually turns from one element into another element. So in this example, we're looking at potassium-40, which is a radioactive isotope, and it emits radiation, and in doing so, it turns into argon. It, go, it turns from potassium-40 into argon, which is a different element. And it takes a long time for that to happen, uh, for any sample anyway, for the whole sample to turn into argon. And we can use that, the amount of uh, time, the period of time that it takes um, to determine the age of a rock that, has, that contains potassium-40. And basically all rocks contain potassium-40. Um, so that process of potassium-40, for example, turning into argon is known as radioactive decay. The potassium-40 is decaying into argon. So it's the transformation of an unstable isotope, like potassium-40, into a lighter one, like argon. And radiation is released uh, in the form of particles. So we have this concept in radiometric dating, uh, the concept is half-life. And this is the time it takes for one half of a radioactive isotope to decay. One half of any amount of any radioactive isotope to decay. So uh, picture in your mind a volcano. And the volcano is erupting and lava is being spewed from the volcano. You know, think of Hawaii, right? And that's what built the Hawaiian Islands, and it's still going on. So the lava solidifies, and when it solidifies into rock, it has its maximum amount of potassium-40, right? It has a certain amount of potassium-40, and it really doesn't have much argon at all. And over time, that potassium-40 will turn into argon. And we can tell how long ago the lava solidified into, into rock, by how much potassium-40 and argon we find in that rock. So when half the potassium-40 is gone, the period of time it took for that to happen, for half of the potassium-40 to go away, to well, not go away, but to uh, decay into argon, that's known as its half-life. And if you look on the scale here, we're talking billions of years. So for any sample uh, or amount of potassium-40, it takes about 1.2 billion years for it half of it to turn into argon, to radioactively decay into argon. It takes another 1.2 billion years, approximately, for it to, uh, for another half of it to decay. So every 1.2 billion years, another half has decayed into argon. That's half-life. <clears throat> so radiometric dating measures absolute age by determining how many half-lives have passed. How many half-lives? So if one half-life has passed, that's 1.2 billion years. If two half-lives have passed, it's 2.4 billion years or 2.5. It's actually not exactly 1.2 billion years, the half-life. Um, but hopefully you get the idea. We just need to determine how many half-lives have passed. So we can do that by, by measuring the proportion of potassium-40 versus argon in a rock. 
So in this example, radiometric dating is performed by determining the relative proportion of potassium-40 versus argon, like I just said. Argon is its decay product. Um, and if you don't understand it here, hopefully you will after performing the gizmo um, that is assigned this week along with this information. So we find, again, find the number of past lives past lives, past half-lives, to deter determine the absolute age. So there are different radioactive isotopes that can be used to do this, and potassium-40 is a good one if you know that the rock or the fossil is really, really old, um, because its half-life its half -life is on the scale of billions of years. There are other uh, radioactive isotopes that have shorter half-lives. Um, so, our solar system and the Earth is no is about five billion years old. So, potassium forty is a good one to use if you uh, want to measure the age of a rock, some of the oldest rocks on Earth, or even rocks that you know, like a uh, a sample from an asteroid or the Moon. If you want to find out how old those rocks are, potassium forty would be a good one because its half life is on the order of billions of years. <clears throat> carbon-14, you may have heard of. Um, one form of radiometric dating is carbon-14 dating, and notice that its half-life is only 5,700 years. So it's more appropriate for determining the age of a fossil that uh, of an organism that died more recently. Um, so for example, archaeological digs, um, once living humans, mummies. Carbon-14 is really good for absolutely dating those kind of things. So they need to have died within the past 30,000 years or so, not not billions of years like for argon-40. This is um, a look at the entire geologic time scale. And so as you can see, there it is divided up in, in many different ways. But again, here we have the eons and the eras and the periods. It just gives you a better idea of the whole picture. Right, and the epochs that I mentioned. And um, you'll notice that some of the periods are divided up into early and mid, middle and late. And the Cambrian is even divided up into uh, letters of the alphabet, interestingly. So we're not going to get into it in this much detail, but I wanted you to get a better idea of the entire geologic time scale. Okay, so the Earth's been here for a really long time, and it's really, it's difficult to get a feel for just how long the Earth has been here. I mean, think, just try to imagine what a billion is. A billion is a thousand million, and, and just to imagine what a million is, is difficult. So a thousand million, a billion, and then when we talk about the age of the Earth, almost five billion years old, and the age of the universe, about 15 billion years old, it just becomes too much to handle. So we generate these models like this clock model to try to get a better handle on when certain things happen, big events. Uh, and that's what we're looking at here. So if you'll notice the color-coded key here, Precambrian time, as we pointed out previously, makes up about 80% of Earth's history. 80% of, of geologic time is the time before the Cambrian period, which on this model begins right here with the Paleozoic era. The very first period of the Paleozoic is the Cambrian period. And then we get into the Mesozoic era and the Cenozoic era. And, and that's really where we're going to concentrate our study. Is That's because that's when most uh, macro animals and plants, uh, macro organisms lived. Um, things that can be seen with the naked eye. But life has been here for a lot longer than that. Uh, so the very first event that we want to place on here is the very first are the very first living things. When did the very first living things appear? And based on uh, molecular fossils, which are just traces of molecules left in the oldest rocks that we can find on the planet, we think that life arose very early after the Earth formed. So here on, on this model, the Earth forms about four four point eight billion years ago, and within a, about 
you know, within a billion years, we get the first prokaryotes, we get the first living things. So approximately four billion years ago. So less than a billion years after the Earth forms, it's speculated that um, we get the first life. But there are no rocks on Earth that are that old. It's very difficult to find evidence of when the first life arose because the rock cycle, which recycles rocks, recycles the Earth's crust, has recycled some of the, uh, or almost all of the oldest rocks there are on the planet. So that's an approximation. These squigglies, uh, tildes, or whatever you want to call them, before uh, these times that I put in parentheses, they uh, mean approximately. So approximately 4 billion years ago, we get the first living things. And I'm also trying to round off a, a little bit here to make it a little easier to, to uh, remember these times. The next big event uh, would be the evolution of oxygenetic photosynthesis. <clears throat> now you know that photosynthesis, photosynthetic organisms give off oxygen. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the evolution of the ability to photosynthesize. There, were, there are different kinds of photosynthesis and some of the earlier kinds of photosynthesis were thought to not generate oxygen. But then we have the evolution of oxygen generating photosynthesis and that starts adding oxygen to the atmosphere. We don't know exactly when that occurred, so I just put it on here, and I didn't put any specific date on here. You know, so you could say around 1.6 or 1.5 billion years ago, we get the evolution of oxygen, oxygenic, oxygenic photosynthesis. Um, but the important thing here is that's when oxygen started building up, not in the atmosphere, but in the oceans, because these organisms are living in the oceans, and the oceans had to get saturated with oxygen first before it started to build up in the atmosphere. So sometime in this period, the oceans get saturated with oxygen, and then it starts building up in the atmosphere. So that was, and I didn't put a date on this one either, because, you know, it's an, an approximation. It's starting to build up. And it built up gradually over a relatively long period of time. But the significance of that is that it drove the evolution of more complex life. For example, eukaryotic cells. These are cells that have a nucleus. They're different than the prokaryotes that first evolved on the planet that don't have a nucleus. So when you think prokaryote, think bacteria. So bacteria were first. Bacteria-like organisms were first. And it took about 2 billion years for more complex cells to evolve. And it, it's thought that it's the accumulation of at atmospheric oxygen that drove that evolution, that caused that to happen. Then another uh, long period of time, about a billion years, before we have the first multicellular organisms. And we're talking about algae here. We're not even talking about animals. We're talking about algae. Uh, so algae, uh, plant-like protists. Algae can be referred to as plant-like protists because they're in the kingdom protista. They were the first to be multicellular. Then we have the evolution of the first animals, the first multicellular animals, about 700 million years ago. And that too is speculation uh, to some extent. We have found fossils that are about 600 million years old, and we think that the evolution of animals occurred somewhere be before that, maybe even a billion years ago back here, but. Um, Somewhere in here, we have the evolution of the first animals, and the problem is that they were soft-bodied. They don't fossilize well, so we can't find many fossils of things that don't have hard parts. But then we have the Cambrian explosion. So here again, at the beginning of the Paleozoic era, right there, about 570 million years ago, we have the Cambrian explosion, and it's called that because we see the appearance of animals in the fossil record because they do evolve hard parts. So soft animals evolve first, then animals started creating things like shells and exoskeletons that fossilize well, and they appear in the fossil record all of a sudden, partly because of that. Then we have the first plants, and plants evolved on land. There's no such thing back, uh, yeah, plants, the definition of a plant is a multicellular 
photosynthetic organism that lives on land and, and evolved on land. Um, they have common ancestry with the algae. So the algae evolved back here and it took this long for plants to move onto land basically or for plants to evolve on land and that was about 470 million years ago. And that allowed for animals to, and to move onto land. So uh, because they had a food source, the, the land plants gave the animals a food source. And we see the radiation of reptiles about 250 million years ago. That's uh, at the end of the uh, Permian period, the end of the Paleozoic era and the end of the Permian period. We had that mass dying, the great dying uh, mass extinction event. And then we see the whole Mesozoic era here represented in uh, green. Um, which was the radiation of reptiles, and then at the end of the Mesozoic, about 65 million years ago, we have another extinction event that removes the reptiles, removes the dinosaurs, basically, not all the reptiles, but removes the dinosaurs, uh, and allows for the radiation of mammals. And then about 200,000 years ago, notice how the, the time scales are changing here that I'm I'm adding. We go from a billion years ago, and then once once we get below a billion, I, I switch over to a million years ago. Uh, but then here, when it comes to the first humans, we have to switch to thousand years ago, TYA. So about two hundred thousand years is all that modern humans have been here, which is basically the blink of an eye. So from the perspective of geologic time, humans have only just arrived. Okay, so here we're looking at how the Earth forms. Now we're going to back up. Now that we've looked at the big picture with that clock model, we're going to back up and take a look at what happened about 4.8, 5 billion or 4.8 billion years ago in the formation of the Earth. So we don't know exactly how the Earth formed or when because no one was there to see it. So all we have is conjecture, uh, evidence, inferences made on evidence that we find um, that has been found. So the Earth's part of the solar system, so the solar system and the Earth formed at the same time. So the Sun formed, and then the planets formed around the Sun, and that all happened approximately at the same time. So the Earth and the solar system were about the same age. They formed from a nebula. A nebula is a cloud of gas and dust. Uh, and gravity works on that cloud of the gas and dust. To, to draw it together to, to produce a dense core in the middle of the cloud and that's what it eventually ignites into a star and then around the star the planets form by what we call planetary accretion. Planetary accretion is when the uh, bits and pieces that are part of that nebula that are still orbiting the, the, that are orbiting the star so it's only the core of the nebula that that uh, ignites into a, a burning star. Uh, and then orbiting that is all the leftover material. And it's that leftover material that undergoes planetary accretion. And again, gravity is working on it in part to uh, pull these pieces together to form larger and larger and larger clumps that eventually uh, accrete into planet-sized, or planetoids is what we would call them first, but then planet-sized uh, chunks. And it took about a hundred million years for that to happen. The moon came from what we're looking at in this image. Uh, a a Mars-sized planetoid slammed into the Earth planetoid, and part of it became part of the Earth, but it also ejected the outer crust that was forming on that Earth planetoid into orbit around the whole thing. And just like the planets accreted from the, um, the material that was orbiting the early Sun, the material that was orbiting the Earth planetoid accreted into the Moon. For about 600 million years after the Earth formed, it was bombarded by, like we're seeing in this image, it was bombarded by, uh, well, planetary accretion basically continued. In other words, material continued to be added to the Earth planetoid as it formed uh, because there were still large bodies that were orbiting the Sun and they were being pulled in by gravity by the Earth planetoid. 
so that we call that period the heavy bombardment. And it kept the earth molten. So during that time, the earth was a, a molten ball of rock. And it remained molten through most of the heavy bombardment. But then the heavy bombardment subsided, and the earth was able to start cooling to the point where it eventually cooled uh, enough to support liquid water. So here we're looking at the outgassing. Um, well, the, the early earth, this, this uh, an artist's version of the early earth, we have cooled to the point where there are liquid oceans, and but the earth is still really hot. And we see the moon really big here because the, the moon, when it first formed, was a lot closer, about 250 million miles closer to the earth than it is today. Um, but the earth was still really hot, and the oceans regularly boiled even, uh, but there was liquid water at least. The first atmosphere was composed of hydrogen and ammonia and nitrogen and carbon dioxide and methane and water vapor, and we know that because that's what comes out of volcanoes today. So if you look at, at this diagram, it shows what comes out of volcanoes. This diagram also shows, though, oxygen being produced by, photosynthet by photosynthetic organisms like this plant, um, but that wasn't around back at this time. So there was no oxygen in the early atmosphere. It wasn't until oxygenic photosynthesis evolved that we see the addition, uh, the beginning of the addition of oxygen first to the oceans and then to the atmosphere. So with no oxygen, there was also no ozone layer. Oxygen, uh, the oxygen that you're breathing right now is O2. Ozone is O3 and it has the ability to stop ultraviolet radiation. So the consequence of there being no ozone layer on the early Earth, because there was no oxygen to make ozone from, uh, is that there was no ultraviolet radiation protection, UV, ultraviolet, right? So you know today that if you don't wear sunscreen, you, you may get skin cancer. And that's because of the ultraviolet radiation. So ultraviolet radiation is very damaging to living things. However, back at this time that was kind of an energy source that may have been important in driving the evolution of life uh, so due to the lack of oxygen the first atmosphere is described as being a reducing atmosphere and you don't need to understand that right now you'll understand that next year when you take chemistry but it's a reducing atmosphere it's not a uh, the word escapes me at the moment oxidizing yeah it's not an oxidizing atmosphere uh, and this but this is important to the evolution of molecular uh, the molecular evolution in other words, the evolution of the parts that will come together to form living things. That's referred to as molecular evolution, because molecules evolve just like uh, living things evolve. So the heavy bombardment ended about 600 million years ago after the Earth formed. Uh, I'm sorry, 600 million years after the Earth formed, not, like, not ago, 600 million years after the Earth formed. So about 4 billion years ago, uh, the heavy bombardment ended, the earth cooled enough for liquid water, so what I'm trying to do here is set the stage. We have uh, the earth cooling, the heavy bombardment ends, the earth cools, we have oceans, so we have water, and we have a reducing atmosphere. And those three things come together to allow for the molecular evolution of life. In other words, the, to allow for the molecules that make up living things to come together and make up living things. That's the easiest way to state that. So how do, how do we know that molecular evolution may have taken place on the early Earth? Well, these sci two scientists named Stanley Miller and Harold Urey back in the 1950s performed an experiment that we now call the Miller-Urey experiment. And they were the first to show that molecular, molecular evolution was possible on the early Earth. So the question they're investigating is, could the organic compounds that form life form on the early Earth? So they were trying to simulate conditions of the early Earth, and they built this apparatus to do that, this chemical apparatus to simulate conditions of the early Earth. And so there are null hypotheses. Remember, there are two kinds of hypotheses. There's the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. And in this case, we're going to look at the null hypothesis. If conditions were not right for the evolution of simple organic compounds on early Earth, and we simulate those conditions, which is what Miller and Urey did, then no compounds will form. So that's the null hypothesis. 
so the apparatus they set up was uh, they added a heat source because the early Earth was hot. As I mentioned, the oceans regularly boiled, and they simulated the oceans by putting water into the apparatus. That water boiled. Uh, water vapor went into the simulated atmosphere, which also contained the other compounds that we knew, or I'm sorry, other elements that we knew were in the early atmosphere. We know that because they come out of volcanoes. They come out from inside the Earth today. And they added a spark because there was weather back in, in, at this time. So there was lightning. There was also ultraviolet radiation. So either lightning, ultraviolet radiation uh, provided energy, along with the heat provided energy. And then they had a condenser, which is similar, you know, if you know the water cycle, the uh, water vapor rises in the atmosphere and it cools and condenses back into liquid and falls as rain. So this basically simulates rain falling in, back into the oceans. Um, but they also had a trap here, this curved tube, just like under your sink at home, there's a curve in the drain pipe that acts as a trap. If you accidentally drop something in your drain, you might be able to get it back. You might find it in the crack, like a wedding ring or something. Um, so, And they also had a valve that they could open and take samples out of the water that was in the trap, or the things that had accumu accumulated in the trap. And the results are that they found simple organic compounds, including fatty acids and amino acids. Now, those are two very important building blocks of living things. And the significant thing also is that this only took a couple of weeks. I mean, usually you think of evolution taking millions of years. And yes, um, big changes do take millions of years. But it looks like it's, it doesn't take that long. And the, the conditions of the early Earth may have been right for the evolution of these simple organic compounds like fatty acids and amino acids. So what's the, what's the big deal about these compounds? Well, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And living things are largely made of proteins. And really, proteins, as you'll hear me say many times this year, proteins run the show. Proteins do everything. They make up just about everything, and they do everything. Fatty acids are components of lipids. Lipids, like fats and waxes and oils, uh, lipids are significant in living things because they make up cell membranes. There's a plasma membrane, a cell membrane around every cell of every living thing, and that's made up largely of lipids. So these, these results refute the null hypothesis. And um, remember, a null hypothesis, it's easier to refute a null hypothesis. And in this case, the null hypothesis was refuted because the, the null hypothesis said that if conditions were not right for the evolution of simple organic compounds, um, then no compounds will, will form. But compounds did form. So this refutes the null hypothesis, suggesting that the Earth may the, the conditions of the early Earth may have been right for life. So that's that's a huge um, huge significant result. And also, this is not the only experiment that, of this type that was ever performed. Remember, one experiment proves nothing. So this experiment has been repeated many times and repeated many times, changing certain variables, you know, because some scientists looked at this critically and skeptically and said, well, maybe those weren't the conditions of the early Earth. Maybe you got the conditions wrong. Well, even if they changed the conditions, uh, certain conditions to, to match what they thought, the early Earth may have been like, we still get the same thing. We still get organic compounds being formed. We've also found organic compounds on asteroids and comets. So it turns out that the building blocks of life, the, the molecular evolution of the building blocks of life, probably take place not only on the Earth, but out outward into our solar system and probably outward into the, the universe even. So the building blocks of life may be very common all over the universe. So now that we know it was possible for the building blocks of life to be around on the early Earth, we the question is, how did those components come together to form cells? Well, again, one of the primary structures of a cell is the cell membrane, the plasma mem membrane that surrounds the cell. And there are very simple compounds that can come together to form a plasma membrane-like structure, a cell membrane-like structure. So we call them protonoid microspheres. 
which are cell-like structures that form when certain proteins interact with water. And there are also liposomes, which are cell-like structures that form when certain lipids interact with water. So here on the left we see uh, proteinoid microspheres made up primarily of protein, and on the right there are liposomes made up primarily primarily of lipids. And if you were to look at these under the microscope, you might guess they were cells, but there's nothing inside these um, structures. They're very simple, just almost like empty containers, uh, empty cell containers. But these are similar to the plasma membranes that surround all living cells. The two compounds that make up the plasma membranes or cell membranes of all living cells are phospholipids and proteins. And both proteins and phospholipids on their own can form plasma mem membrane-like structures, but it, it appears that these two compounds combine uh, to form the cell membranes that we find around living things today. So we call this thing a protocell. We call you know the, the first cell-like structures were referred, are, are referred to as protocells, kind of like a prototype, right? If you're inventing something, you might have a prototype that uh, is a model or represents the very first one that the very first of whatever you're inventing that you created. That's a prototype. Well, these things are referred to as protocells, the very first cell-like structures that ever formed. Um, and they found that they are capable of perform performing a few basic cellular functions. Even though they're kind of like empty cells, they can still carry out certain cellular functions. Um, one of them being the ability to store energy, another to perform enzymatic reactions, and even reproduce, sort of. It's kind of like a, if you have a, well, you know that oil floats on top of water, so if you put one of these liposomes on, uh, you know, find one of these liposomes floating on the top of water, you can very easily split it into two liposomes. So that's kind of the, the rudimentary uh, reproduction we're talking about. So now that we have something that looks like a cell, has a plasma membrane, living things also contain, all living things today contain DNA, contain genetic information. So how did that evolve? Because uh, without genetic information, there is no life. Um, well, first a reminder that simple organic compounds formed from inorganic matter on the early earth um, was possible that was shown by the miller your experiment. So we have the components of life. Um, and we also have this hypothesis known as the RNA world hypothesis. And, you know, so I, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with DNA um, as being the genetic material of life. And uh, DNA is made up of genes. And there's a hypothesis. There's another kind of... Um, DNA-like molecule card called RNA, and RNA is simpler than DNA in a number of ways. So there's a hypothesis that RNA was first, and the other thing about RNA is it can do all the things that DNA can do, um, and that's what I'm trying to show with this diagram. This represents RNA. So back when this genetic information was first evolving, RNA could do everything. RNA can make proteins. That's what we're seeing uh, on this arrow. RNA can copy itself, make more RNA, and DNA can be made from RNA. So RNA can do everything. <clears throat> and so it's speculated that RNA was first because of that. And then later, DNA evolved as a more stable way to store the genetic information. And, cop and more reliable way to copy that information and pass that information on to, uh, to uh, offspring, eventually. But one thing that RNA does more frequently than DNA is mutate, because it's less stable. So again, DNA probably evolved as a more stable way to store genetic information. Because, so RNAs, uh, RNA mutates much more than DNA does but because of that, it introduces a lot of variation. And you know that variation is the raw material of natural selection and evolution. So RNA probably evolved quickly. 
because it mutates so much, it probably evolved quickly. It, it was subject to to molecular <clears throat> molecular natural selection. So that's um, kind of the idea of molecular evolution, that molecules can evolve just like living things, just like species um, and populations can evolve. So all that, although RNA can do it all, DNA probably evolved, like I said, as a more stable way to store and copy the genetic information. Uh, RNA is not considered alive. It doesn't have all the characteristics of life. If you'll recall, back at the beginning uh, of the year, we looked at all the characteristics and, and the idea is that to be considered alive, you have to have all the characteristics of life. And yeah, RNA has a, a few characteristics of life, like it can replicate itself, but that's that's about all, that's about it. So now that we have cell structure and cell cellular information, um, we really have everything that's needed to uh, have the first living things. And the first living things, uh, you know, fossils of the first living things are really hard to come by. They, they would be micro fossils because cells are microscopic. So you have to use a microscope to see them. And these images represent some of the oldest fossils that we found that appear to be um, bacteria. And not just bacteria, but a certain kind of bacteria known as cyanobacteria that is able to produce oxygen. It's able to photosynthesize and produce oxygen. However, just because these look like cyanobacteria doesn't necessarily mean they are cyanobacteria. It doesn't necessarily mean they do photosynthesize, but they definitely look like some form of uh, early cellular life. So the significance of these, the fossil uh, find here is that oxygen, it may represent the beginning of oxygen production. So if this represents the earliest oxygen production, that means that oxygen production may have begun about 3.465 billion years ago, or about 3.5 billion years ago. And as I mentioned previously, the oxygen first dissolved in the oceans. So, you know, as soon as oxygen started being produced by photosynthetic life, it didn't go directly into the atmosphere. It built up in the oceans for millions of years um, and combined with iron and formed uh, iron oxide, which you know as rust. And that build up in these thick deposits that we now dig up as iron ore. So when, if you're in an iron mine, what they're digging up is iron ore, which formed during this time. Uh, the iron ore that's being dug up is basically uh, iron oxide that was formed when oxygen first started being added to the oceans and it combined with iron to, to form those thick deposits of iron oxide. Free oxygen is the term we use to refer to O2 in the atmosphere, oxygen gas that is available um, it, both in the oceans and the atmosphere. So oxygen continued to dissolve in the oceans until the water eventually became saturated. In, in other words, all the iron was removed from the ocean water, basically, combined with oxygen, sank to the bottom, built up as, as iron oxide deposits. Um, but then, and then free oxygen was uh, available in the water, but eventually, you know, water can only hold so much free oxygen, and that free oxygen then started being released into the atmosphere. So about 2.2 billion years ago, the ocean saturation allowed for oxygen release into the atmosphere, and oxygen started building up in the atmosphere. But that took a long time, too, um, millions of years. So um, the thing about oxygen is it's a very reactive compound it will tear things up. Um, it's oxidizing, right? Remember, it was, it, it was important that the early atmosphere be a reducing atmosphere because oxygen wasn't around. It wasn't an oxidizing atmosphere. An oxidizing atmosphere would have torn up the simple organic compounds that were first formed. So it's really significant that it was a reducing atmosphere when the molecules, the building blocks of life first formed, first evolved through molecular evolution. But with the addition of oxygen now, um, because oxygen is such a reactive uh, element, it actually killed a lot of the first cells that evolved because they couldn't handle the oxygen. Um, a lot of those early prokaryotic organisms were killed by the oxygen. But some species evolved, uh, survived and evolved. They evolved the ability to handle the oxygen. 
Again, this buildup of oxygen was very slow, both in the oceans and the atmosphere. So this slow buildup allowed for, allowed for the evolution of life to keep up with that change. Um, so gradual change, life usually will uh, evolve and adapt to. Quick change, fast change, uh, life might have a harder time adapting to, evolving adaptations for. So for example, climate change. We're really worried about climate change happening so fast that most of the species on the planet won't be able to adapt. Okay, so if you've been following, uh, we just had the evolution of prokaryotic cells, the first living things on Earth, and they eventually evolved the ability to photosynthesize, possibly as early as about 3.5 billion years ago. And so the oxygen, as I mentioned, uh, was first released into the oceans, bound to iron, that, but then eventually free oxygen became available in the oceans, um, and then in the atmosphere approximately 2.2 billion years ago. And that drove this event that's known as endosymbiosis. So the endosymbiotic theory is what we're looking at here. And what it tries to explain and again, this is through inference because we don't have a time machine to go back and see how this happened. But the idea is this is where eukaryotic cells came from. So the first living things were prokaryotic cells, bacteria that don't have a nucleus. And then we see the appearance of eukaryotic cells. And we think this is how prokaryotic cells came together through endosymbiosis to create or give rise to eukaryotic cells. There's a lot of information on here, so I'm just pretty much going to go down the list of uh, the notes that are going to come up just to keep me from going off on, on a tangent and talking too much. Um, so when oxygen was added to the oceans and atmosphere, that was poison, as I mentioned on the previous slide, to a lot of the organisms that were alive at that time. And again, these are prokaryotes, bacteria, that had evolved without oxygen. So they couldn't handle the oxygen. So they either went extinct or they adapted. In this diagram, <clears throat> you'll notice the archaeal ana anaerobic prokaryote. Archaeal refers to um, a certain branch of prokaryotes, one of the first uh, living things on the planet, or some of the first living things on the planet. Archaeal refers to ancient. So these are ancient, anaerobic, referring to not able to handle oxygen, not able to use oxygen. And these, so these are the ones that were in danger of being killed by oxygen and going extinct. The aerobic bacteria would be the, uh, the other branch of bacteria the other branch of prokaryotes, I should say. Um, and these had evolved the ability to handle oxygen through the process of cellular respiration. In other words, they had evolved cellular respiration, which uses oxygen to break down molecules to get energy. That's, in a nutshell, that's what cellular respiration is. The important thing here is, though, that they weren't killed. They were the kind of bacteria that were not killed by oxygen. They actually evolved a way to use the oxygen. To their advantage. So the aerobic bacteria came to live inside the archaeal anaerobic prokaryote. And one scenario might be that the archaeal anaerobic prokaryote uh, intended to eat the aerobic bacteria, but then didn't digest it. Once it got inside the aerobic bacteria wasn't broken down and used as food, and that aerobic bacteria just came to live inside the um, archaeal anaerobic prokaryote, and so it just kind of kept it around. And we actually see that happening in cells today. There are uh, amoebas that will take in uh, algal cells and, and not digest them, and uh, just keep them around. The algae makes food for the amoeba. Uh, kind of the same idea here, but in this case, the uh, aerobic bacteria that was taken in would be breaking, using oxygen, protecting the archaeal anaerobic prokaryote from being killed by the oxygen, 
and making food in the pro or making energy in the process or, or transforming energy is what I should say in the process. So this would be considered a eukaryote. Um, other membranes infolding of the plasma membrane is thought to create a, a membrane around the DNA in the cell, which is what's being represented here by what's labeled the nucleus. And other organelles would be created by the infolding of the plasma membrane also, which we also see uh, creating structures in prokaryotic cells today. <clears throat> So this partnership is, is mutualistic symbiosis, which is something that we learned about uh, in a previous unit, the, our ecology unit. So it's a form of symbiosis, and it benefits both partners, right? Endosymbiosis is when one of the partners in a symbiotic relationship is inside the other partner. For example, you have bacteria that live in your digestive tract. They are endosymbionts. They are your endosymbionts. So the photo, uh, so notice that there are two branches to this diagram. So this represents one endosymbiotic event that uh, gave rise to eukaryotes that had mito have mitochondria, which that line still has mitochondria today, and it includes protozoa, the animal like protus, fungi and animals, including us. But there's another line where symbios end endosymbiosis happens again. So because there are two endosymbiotic events going on uh, back to back, one after the other, that's a series, right? So we refer to it as serial, serial endosymbiosis. So in this line that eventually leads to algae and plants, photosynthetic eukaryotic organisms, represented by algae and plants, that line required serial endosymbiosis where once the endosymbiotic event that um, gave rise to mitochondria in, in eukaryotic cells took place, then we have another endosymbiotic event that gives rise to chloroplasts. And so they have both chloroplasts and mitochondria. Two endosymbiotic events, the first giving rise to mitochondria, and the second given, giving rise to chloroplasts, which are photosynthetic. So the idea is that photosynthetic bacteria, like I just mentioned about the amoeba taking an algae and then just keeping the algae around to make food, well, that's what's going on here. The chloroplasts are photosynthesizing, making glucose, which is food um, that the host organism, in this case, could, could uh, take advantage of and use. <coughs> As I mentioned, the membranes, other organelles then can form or did form from the infolding of the plasma membrane, because all the other organelles are mem very membranous, like you may, have, may be familiar with some of those endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi bodies. As I also mentioned previously, you have endosymbionts in your body that make up your microbiome. You've got, you've got a lot of bacteria that live in and on your body, and they make up your microbiome, but it's the ones that are inside your body that are endosymbionts, just to get across that, that term, uh, vocabulary term for you. So each of these lines were progenitors of the four eukaryotic king kingdoms. So as we classify living things today, there are four eukaryotic kingdoms, and they're all represented here. Uh, Serial endosymbiosis, again, resulted in algae and, and plants. Algae are photo, uh, photosynthetic protists. <clears throat> um, so that's the kingdom protista, the kingdom plantae. Uh, the non-serial line here that, was, that only involves one endosymbiotic event, uh, giving rise to mitochondria, leads to protista, which we already identified it here. Uh, but then fungi and animalia. The other kingdoms are prokaryotic, so that accounts for all the kingdoms. The evidence that this happened, because again, this is all inference, uh, the evidence is evidence that mitochondria and chloroplasts were once free-living. 
And you really should know uh, this evidence. I didn't have time, or, or not time, I didn't have space to put it on the slide, as you can see. The slide's pretty packed. But uh, you ought to list these, these evidences that suggest that mitochondria and uh, chloroplasts were once free-living organisms. And generally, um, you know, the, the most obvious thing is they kind of look like bacteria. Their size and structure uh, look like bacteria. When you look at them under the microscope, they're about the same size as bacteria or uh, prokaryotic cells, and they have this, some similar structure to prokaryotic cells. They have their own DNA, and that's one of the most important pieces of evidence. Uh, no other organelle has its own DNA. So mitochondria has its own little ring of DNA, and chloroplasts have their own little ring of DNA, and it's that structure of the, that DNA that e e looks like uh, prokaryotic DNA also, because prokaryotes um, have little rings of DNA. Um, that's what makes up their, they have one single chromosome that is a ring of DNA. And then the last piece is that they, they reproduce inside our cells. And I say our because we are eukaryotes. We're in the animal kingdom and we are eukaryotes. So the mitochondria in your cells reproduce by binary fission, just like prokaryotic cells do, just like bacteria do. Same with chloroplasts. They reproduce inside the cells that have them. They reproduce by binary fission. They just split in two, just like bacteria. Okay, so those were some really important events. Endosymbiosis, the evolution of eukaryotic cells, and the evolution of sexual reproduction, that kind of set the stage for the evolution of more complex life. And here we're looking at just before the Cambrian expo explosion. So this is still in Precambrian time, but it's at the very end of Precambrian time. If you recall, that's the Vendian period. So in the Vendian period, we find fossils, the first fossils of animal life, multicellular animal life, but they're very rare because at that time animals were soft-bodied. They didn't have hard parts. That's, that's one reason anyway. And they weren't as numerous. They weren't as uh, widespread. So their fossils are, are relatively rare. But we have found fossils of animals that date back as far as 600 million years, which is long before the Cambrian explosion. Um, when we find all kinds of animal fossils because they evolved hard parts. So a couple examples here. The oldest, uh, some of the oldest fossils are actually micro fossils. So you have to use a microscope to see them, but they represent embryos. These are multicellular animal embryos. And I, I put an image of a frog embryo here so you can make the comparison between this fossil embryo that's 600 million years old and a frog embryo. Um, this one, Dickinsonia is a an animal that is a relative uh, thought to be a relative of annelids. So this is a, a early annelid, <clears throat> which is uh, the phylum, the animal phylum that includes earthworms. So the the lines on here are kind of the same thing as the rings that you see going down the body of an earthworm. They're segmented. They have segments. I should mention too that this is at the end of the Proterozoic era. So again, uh, we've gone from the Proterozoic era and the, the Vendian period to the Paleozoic era and the Cambrian period being the first period of the Paleozoic. And we see this event known as the Cambrian explosion, all kinds of animals. And this is kind of a neat uh, representation of geologic time and where we are now in geo geologic time is right here. So we see the expansion here and the kind of organisms that we find in the fossil record from this time. They look really weird and alien-like. But again, they're some of the first animals to have evolved. Uh, this being kind of an artist's snapshot of what it might have been like. I mean, they probably piled a lot more animals into this this uh, picture than would actually be there, but it gives you some idea of the variety of animal life that was around at that time. So a better word than explosion would probably be adaptation or radiation. So to call this the Cambrian, Cambrian radiation would be my preferred term, but that's not what we call it. We call it the Cambrian explosion. So all the current animal phyla uh, that are on the earth today got their start back in the Cambrian. So we can find representatives of all the, all the animals that are alive today. Um, back at, at this time. 
<clears throat> so they're all invertebrates. There were no vertebrates back in the Cambrian. Um, so mollusks, mollusks and arthropods primarily is what we find in the fossil record. A wide variety of uh, arthropods. We find echinoderms too. Um, that's represented by this this guy right here, uh, sea urchin, like. So that's what the Cambrian looked like. Um, and the next slide kind of shows or depicts the same thing, artist's version. And there are a lot of different organisms listed here, but the one that I want you to um, focus on is the possible ancestor of vertebrates, and therefore the possible ancestor that existed back in the Cambrian of us. And that would be this guy, Pacaya, number 22. Whoops, and number 22 is right here in this photo. So this little swimming worm-like thing um, is possibly our own ancestor that was alive back in the Cambrian, and um, it had something sort of like a backbone called a notochord, uh, which makes it a chordate, which is our own phylum, phylum chordata, uh, but it didn't have a backbone. It was still an invertebrate, so it had a backbone like supportive structure, but it didn't have a backbone. So finally in this unit we're looking at the uh, patterns of evolution, and one of the major patterns of evolution is extinction. And there have been five mass extinctions, and that's what's shown here on this graph. We're looking at global diversity since the origin of the Earth, um, and it's not to scale, of course, uh, this part is. Um, so the thing to understand about extinction is, is that it's the rule, not the exception. In other words, there have been all of these mass extinctions, and there will continue to be mass extinctions. In fact, um, some believe that there's a mass extinction occurring right now because of our own activity. This, uh, this figure is really cool, and if you concentrate on uh, studying what it's showing, um, first of all, it you know this one was created using global diversity. In other words, all the species lumped together. This one was created using the number of families, um, which is a slightly different way of looking at it, but it pretty much shows the same thing. All of the five mass extinctions are here and labeled, but it also is really interesting the way it's color-coded um, to show the Cambrian fauna and the Paleozoic fauna, and by the way, fauna refers to animal life, right? Flora is plant life and fauna is animal life. Um, modern fauna, and, and what's interesting there is to follow the modern fauna all the way back to the Cambrian and see that uh, the modern fauna had their start in the Cambrian period. Uh, so basically everything had its start in the Cambrian period, all fauna. So what I'm asking you to do here is label the geologic periods that correspond to each extinction event. So just like they did here, just to kind of put it into your mind, it'd be a good exercise to, to label each one of these on this graph because they're not labeled on this graph. <clears throat> so if we transfer the end Ordovician is here, the late Devonian is here, the end Permian, and look how big that is. That, that's the one they call the Great Dying, where 95% of species in the ocean died, and 70% of land species, terrestrial species, died. That's a huge one at the end of the Permian. End Triassic, and End Cretaceous, which is the famous one that everybody knows about. And we know the most about that one because it is more recent, and we know it was caused by an asteroid impact. There's a crater off the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico that is probably the impact crater from that asteroid strike. It, it That crater dates to about 66 million years ago, which is when this actually happened. Even though it says 65 here, they just kind of rounded to 66 to 65. And there's this little blip right here too. So there have been other, and there are other little blips that aren't being shown on this graph. Um, so there have been other mass extinction events, but not as massive mass extinction events as the five that are counted as the five big ones. We don't know what caused all of these, um, <clears throat> but like I said, we know more about the more recent ones, especially that one 65 million years ago.
So also notice that when you uh, look at what's going on here, the general trend is an increase in diversity over time. And you'll, so you'll notice that the number of species kind of spring back higher than they were before the mass extinction event. So we have a mass extinction event and then species recover. Mass extinction event, species recover. Huge mass ex extinction event, species recover, but not this is the only place where they don't recover uh, before the next one higher than the one before. Another little ex extinction event at the end of the Triassic, but then we have this huge recovery. Um, so that that's just the other thing that I wanted you to note here, is that extinction, um, you know, you could even think of extinction as kind of helping uh, evolution. And it definitely has an effect on the types of species that uh, are now on the planet. Every one of these extinction events has uh, set the stage for the species that we now have on the planet to be here. So it's a very important pattern of evolution. So the effect of, of an extinction event is that niches are vacated. In other words, the species that were in niches are now gone. And that means that niches are available for other species to adapt into and take over, basically. Um, so here we're looking at mammals. These are all the different families of mammals. Um, and if you trace the, this is a phylogenetic tree, it shows evolutionary relationships. And if you trace back uh, on all these branches, you find that they come together to common ancestry. And so the branching out of lines of evolutionary descent is what's referred to as adaptive radiation. All these different mammal species, or mammal groups, I should say, mammal families are branching out, or orders actually, uh, they're orders, like kingdom phylum class order, right? They're in the class mammalia. Uh, and so each one of these is a different order. And all these different orders evolved uh, to fill different niches. So that's the idea of adaptive radiation, the branching out of new species from common ancestry to fill available niches. And after extinction events, there are all kinds of available niches. So we see adaptive radiation. After extinction events, we see adaptive radiation of the surviving species. And that's basically what that says. So mammals adaptively radiated following the Cretaceous mass extinction that removed the dinosaurs, in the same way that Darwin's finches adaptively radiated from the common from common ancestry in the Galapagos Islands, and and so that's what he realized. That's what he observed. That's what he saw. He knew that 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 same thing applied to species on different continents, um, and we can we see here that the same thing applies to the species following mass extinction events. Adaptive radiation can also be referred to as divergent evolution or divergence. The, the uh, species are diverging from common ancestry. Here we're looking at convergent evolution, which is kind of the opposite idea, um, where species that are not related to each other evolve characteristics that cause them to have similar morphologies. Remember, morphology means the shape or form of something because they have evolved to adapt to the same kind of niche. So here, for example, we're looking at marsupials. We're comparing marsupial mammals and placental mammals. So the placental mammals are on the left, and these are, you know, humans are placental mammals. And the, all the mammals except for one, the, the possum in North America, are placental mammals. So we are most familiar with placental mammals. In Australia, however, there are all kinds of marsupial mammals. But you'll notice that, for example, there's a placental mole and a marsupial mole. They're not both moles because they are closely related to each other. They're not in the same order. Um, they, they are both moles because they've adapted to the, to the mole niche. So, for example, you know that moles have poor eyesight or, or very little eyesight at all. Uh, and both these species have that characteristic, not because they're closely related, not because they uh, inherited that from a common ancestor, but because they live underground. And 
eyesight isn't important when you're living underground. So that's the idea of convergent evolution. The morphology of these animals has converged to look similar, have and be similar because they've adapted to similar niches, not because of common ancestry. We call these similarities analogous. So again, the fact that moles have poor eyesight, that's analogous. That's an analogous characteristic or an analogous structure. Um, so that's a vocabulary term you need to be aware of. It's, it's the opposite of homologous. Homologous structures result from common ancestry. Analogous structures result from convergent evolution. <clears throat> this is this is a long-winded explanation of all these different examples, and I've already explained the marsupial example. We've also got an example comparing uh, the wings of different species that are able to fly. So like the moth, the pterosaur, which is an extinct uh, reptile, right, flying reptile, uh, birds, and bats. Um, and so the idea here is that they all have wings and the wings have similar morphology because they've all adapted to allow the species that have them to be able to fly. Uh, not So the, the wings don't have similar morphology because of common ancestry. These species are very, very distantly related to each other. They have similar morphology because they've all adapted to the function of flight. That's the idea of convergent evolution. The evolution of the wing structure here has converged to allow these species to be able to fly. Um, fish, mammal, reptile, right? Very distantly related to each other. Therefore, the, the fact that they all have the same body shape, we call this the fusiform shape. They all have this fusiform shape, like bullet shape, so they can uh, they're hydrodynamic. They can glide through the water easily. That's an adaptation to living in an aquatic environment. So they don't look similar because they're, they have common ancestry, close common ancestry. They look similar because they've adapted to be able to glide through the water more easily. That's convergent evolution. Their evolution has converged because they live in a similar niche. Eyes between the octopus and the vertebrate. In other words, your eye has this structure, and an octopus's eye has this structure, not because we're closely related to octopi, but because of convergent evolution. Eye structure. It turns out there there's one uh, uh, that this structure allows for forming a good, clear image, um, and both eyes have evolved to have that same structure because both of these kinds of organisms or species need to be able to form a nice clear image. <clears throat> so they've converged. And then finally, this is an extreme example, but um, and it's a science fiction kind of example, that if dinosaurs had not gone extinct, that the ones that were bipedal, walking on two legs, may have evolved to become more humanoid-like because we wouldn't be here if dinosaurs had not gone extinct, we wouldn't be here, and possibly they may have evolved to fill our niche. It's a, like I said, an extreme science fiction kind of example, but that's the idea of convergent evolution. So don't confuse convergent evolution with coevolution. They are kind of similar sounding words. Coevolution is something that we've seen before. It results from symbiotic relationships both positive and negative symbiotic relationships. Um, so what we're talking about are two, two or more species that evolve in response to selective pressures created by the other. In other words, they evolve together through time and they evolve in response to each other's, to changes in each other. So for example, here we're looking at ants living on an acacia tree, and the acacia tree produces these, these oversized thorns that are hollow on the inside to allow the ants to live inside the thorns. So the ants live in the tree, they never leave the tree. The tree also produces food for the ants, a, a, a sugary substance. It secretes a sugary sap that the ants actually can eat. <clears throat> 
Now, why does the tree go to all this trouble to provide food and shelter for ants? Because the ants help protect the tree. So here's one scenario. An elephant, elephants like to eat acacia beans. Acacias produce bean pods, right? And elephants come along and they want to eat the beans. But believe it or not, teeny tiny ants are able to protect the acacia against elephants because they'll crawl up into the trunk of the elephant and start biting the elephant from inside its trunk. As you can imagine, that, that is a big deterrent to elephants. But this is a great example of coevolution, where the tree has uh, adapted to allow for ants to live on it, and the ants have adapted to live nowhere else but this tree, and to have this behavior where they protect the tree. Another great example would be insects and flowers. Again, flowers evolved in plants as a way to use animals to disperse their pollen from flower to flower. Um, and then insects have adapted to be able to take advantage of the pollen and the nectar that the flowers uh, are offering up as food. So bees, for example, evolved to better be able to pick up pollen and pick up nectar from the flowers and the flowers have adapted to attract the bees and provide the pollen um, or make it easy for the bees to get the pollen and make it easy for the bees to get the nectar. Um, so they have co-evolved. Another example, and this is a negative example, so both of those are mutualistic uh, symbiotic relationships. Uh, more of a parasitic symbiotic relationship is the relationship between viruses and us. So viruses make us sick, right? But your body has evolved to be immune to, will evolve to be immune to viruses, but then the virus will change, will adapt, will evolve to make us sick again, and then will evolve to make us immune to the virus, and then the virus will mutate and evolve and change to make us sick again. And that's the whole scenario between the flu virus and us. So that's why you need a flu shot every year, because the virus mutates and changes and will make you sick again if you don't get a flu shot and build up that immunity. So there's, um, there's like a, an arms race going on between pathogens that make us sick and our immune system that evolves to uh, protect us from those pathogens. And then finally, we've got this uh, like global example where life and the earth have kind of co-evolved because life has had a huge impact on the, the uh, conditions of the Earth. The Earth would be totally different if life had not evolved on the planet. You know, it wouldn't be green, it wouldn't be blue, it wouldn't uh, have oxygen in the atmosphere. So that's the idea. Um, Coevolution. Symbiotic. Two other patterns of evolution uh, are known as gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. And it has to do with the idea that some uh, species come into being. This is known as speciation. Speciation can be the result of slow, gradual change over long periods of time. But it can also be the result of very rapid change and rapid evolution over a relatively short period of time. So that's the difference here. And there's really no need to, to, I mean, there has been controversy about this and arguments about this between evolutionary biologists, but really there's no reason to argue. Probably both of these mechanisms are operating depending on conditions. If the species are evolving in a relatively stable environment, then we probably are going to see gradualism. Um, and this is basically the idea that Darwin uh, came up with too. Punctuated equilibrium, this came out of the fossil record because it appeared that species were evolving very rapidly and then not changing for long periods of time. So that, that rapid evolution that may have resulted from catastrophe um, was is the punctuated part of punctuated equilibrium. And then the long periods of no, not changing, notice that this species here isn't changing over this long period of time. It changes very rapidly. At, when it first comes into being, but then it doesn't change at all for a very long period of time. And that, so it's in equilibrium. That's the equilibrium part of punctuated equilibrium. 
So again, depending on conditions, probably both of these are ways that species come into being, speciation. So just how rapid can rapid uh, changes take place in evolution? So for example, the punctuated equilibrium, how is it that a species can change so fast in a relatively short period of time? Well, there are these very special sets of genes known as Hox genes, which is short for homeobox. Hox is short for homeobox, which, is, which simply means that um, there are a, a set of genes. In the genome of a species, there are, there's this set of genes. And it turns out that all animals have these Hox genes. So they they appeared very early on in animal evolution, and they've been passed down. They're, they're homologous in all animal species. They're master genes that regulate the expression of sets of other other sets of genes involved in the development of whole body regions or structures. And if you watch that that video um, um, from the from the evolution series, great uh, great transformations. They told the story of a couple of scientists who were kind of trying trying to find these Hox genes, find the effect of one of these Hox genes in fruit flies, um, and that's a great example. So if you haven't watched that, I, I urge you to watch that. Insects are a good example of this because they are segmented, um, and like in that video, they were looking at fruit flies and how the different segments or body regions of the fruit flies were controlled by Hox genes. So in, in this example, in this figure, the idea is that ancient insects had the Hox genes active for creating wings in every one of their segments. Now you'll notice that some of the wings are bigger in some segments and smaller in other segments, but they were producing wings all along their body, for probably for functions other than flight. And then a mutation in the Hox genes caused the wings to no longer form in all the segments, but only one or two segments. Uh, and this is the region of the body known as the thorax. And that's typically where wings are developing in insects today is from the thorax. But the idea here is that it would take a relatively, um, you know, because the Hox genes control other genes, the Hox genes are responsible for turning on the set of genes that forms the wings. That a mutation in a Hox gene can cause a huge change, a big change in a very short period of time, even one generation. So in other words, this could be the offspring of this species. Just in one generation, we can see the reduction in the number of wings, the reduction in wings being in every segment to being just in one segment and growing, any, and growing larger. So this change can happen virtually instantly. So mutations affecting location, in other words, where the Hox genes are turned on is going to determine where the wings form. Mutations affecting timing can cause the structures to form at a different time. So, you know, maybe the wings don't form until the insect uh, is older. And then mutations affecting duration can cause structures to change in size. So in other words, the wings grow for a longer period of time, therefore they grow larger, as opposed to wings that grow for a shorter period of time and don't grow as large. So that's the idea, the power of the Hox genes to control the development of whole body regions and whole body structures. It's been suggested that mutations in Hox genes regulating the timing and duration of brain development could have produced larger brains in human ancestors. So just a, a little mutation in a Hox gene that would cause the brain to grow for a longer period of time during development may have resulted in our brains being larger. And because, and larger brains have greater capacity to think, um, and that made our ancestors more successful, and so on. Uh, so they were selected for it. I don't think anybody's done it, but there's the possibility of experimenting with that idea. Um, experimental evidence supporting this hypothesis may result from genetically engineering chimpanzees with the human gene responsible for, for brain development, with the human uh, Hox gene responsible for brain development, to see if we could grow larger brains in chimpanzees. <laughs>
our closest relative. So that's the power of Hox genes. That's how species can, can uh, evolve very quickly over a relatively short period of time. 